All righty. Well, uh, just by a show of hands this morning, and if you're worshiping with us online, feel free to type it in. Uh, how many of you have been to New York City before? All right. A lot of people. Very good. Uh, of those of you who have been to New York City, how many of you have been to a place called Chinatown? All right. Pretty good amount. Very good. Very good. For those of you who have not been to Chinatown, New York City, if you want to get fake knockoff designer merchandise, that is the place that you go in New York City. In fact, about 15 years ago, my wife Elaine, she was my girlfriend at the time, we had just graduated from high school, and that summer, we decided that we were going to go on a mission trip with our church up into Canada, and on the way, our group stopped for a day in New York City. And Elaine and I and my brother, who was also on the trip, we had never been to New York City before, and so we were just the typical tourists, right? We went to the Statue of Liberty. We saw the United Nations. We went to the 9-11 Memorial that was being constructed at the time. We popped our head in Central Park. We visited all these beautiful churches and NBC headquarters. We had lunch at the Stardust Diner. And if all of that wasn't enough for one day, Elaine had heard about this place called Chinatown where you could get knockoff coach purses for a fraction of the cost. Okay, 15 years ago, the most popular purse amongst women apparently was the coach purse, and everybody had to have a coach purse, and so my brother and I decided that we would join her on this little journey to Chinatown to get her fake coach purse. So here we are, it's late afternoon, we, we arrive in Chinatown, and if you've been there before, there's kind of like a main drag, they have some indoor shops, they also have tables set up, and you can kind of look around, and man, I'll tell you what, all sorts of fake merchandise uh, for, that, 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 that I had never seen before, and we saw all these purses, but here's the thing, we didn't see any coach purses, and we're looking around, we're thinking, huh, well, that's, that's kind of strange, like, the coach purse is the most popular purse. I mean, people told Elaine, hey, when you go to New York City, go to Chinatown and get yourself a coach purse. Where are all the purses? Well, eventually we asked somebody, and she said, hey, um, basically that the New York City police officers, they've been cracking down on specific brands, specifically in this moment, coach purses, because everybody was flooding to, chi flooding to Chinatown to get their fake coach purses. And so the coach purses had basically gone underground. And if you wanted one, you'd have to ask a vendor. They'd have to believe that you're not an undercover cop or working for an undercover cop. And then, of course, they would allow you to, to see their stash from wherever they were hiding it. And so we decided, okay, let's do that. We asked a couple people, and they gave us strange looks, like, don't know what you're talking about. You know, finally, we went into a shop, and we asked this lady, and she just stared at us for a moment. And then she looked outside, and then she looked at us again. She said, I don't have coach purses, but I know somebody who does. Follow me. And so she leaves her shop, and it was kind of strange. Like, you're just going to leave your shop? Oh, okay, so, so she left the shop, and we follow her out, and we head down the street of, you know, the main drag in Chinatown, and we're following her about two blocks when all of a sudden she makes this sharp left and heads down this dark and creepy alleyway. And it was in this moment that the three of us sort of stopped and we looked at each other like, wait a second, should we go down that alleyway? We were looking like, I don't know, what should we do? And, and finally, the lady, she turned around, she realized we were uneasy, and she said, no, 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 come this way, the, the coach person, right down here, right down here, come on, come on, come on. And so we looked at each other, there's, there's, there's tension going on, what do we do, do we keep going, do we not? And finally, amidst all the advice that our parents gave us when we were younger, we decided to follow this lady that we did not know down a dark and creepy alleyway. And so finally we get about halfway down this alleyway and she opens up this side door and we walk inside the side door and there's this man and he has all these hats that he's selling. And we're like, okay, that's not coach purses. Those are hats. And, but Elaine said, okay, well, we're looking for a coach purse. And again, the guy sort of looked at the woman that brought us there and then he looked out into the alleyway. And then we thought that he was going to reach under the counter and he was going to pull out all of his coach purses. Instead, he went to the wall that was right behind him and he pressed this little button and the wall opened up to a secret room behind the wall. And before we knew it, he sort of shuffled us into the room and then shut the wall behind us. And so here we were in this probably six foot by three foot room and we're looking around on the four walls and there are about 50 different fake coach purses. And we're looking around at them, and all of a sudden, we hear this sound right beneath our feet. Hey, which one do you want to buy? And we look down, and there's this middle-aged woman. She's crouched in the corner of this really tight room. And again, she says, hey, which one do you want to buy? And they was like, um, ma'am, we need to get out of here. Like, we, we, we need to get out of here right now. Like, please, let us out. She said, no, 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 no. He won't let you out unless you buy something. 
And I'm like, oh, come on, you got to be kidding me. And sure enough, I, I pressed on the wall, and somehow he had bolted it from the outside. We literally could not push the wall open, and we realized in this moment that we were not getting out of this room until we bought a purse. Now, friends, consider how quickly this escalated. Okay, we, Elaine wanted a purse. We went to Chinatown. We asked to see coach purses. We then followed a lady that we didn't know down a dark and creepy alleyway. We went into a shop. There was a secret wall, opened up, shoved us in a secret room, and now we could not get out because this lady was going to make us buy a purse before we could even get out of there. And at this point, as a teenager, you're thinking, this could be a whole lot more here. We're trapped somewhere in a place we do not know. We need to get out of here. So finally, I said, Elaine, just get the cheapest purse that you can see. And so we're asking the prices. And apparently, when you're trapped inside a room, they get to name the prices, not you, right? And so we're asking, hey, well, finally, there was a $40 purse. And we're like, well, that's not what we wanted to spend. But okay, $40, just give her the $40. She gave the $40. We got the purse. And then I kid you not, she did this sort of like secret knocking code on the wall, like do, 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 do. And she did it. And the wall opened up. The guy let us out. And we ran. I mean, we ran out of that store. We actually ran out of Chinatown. And in fact, here's a picture. Take a look at this. This was 20 minutes after we got out of Chinatown, this is Elaine with that coach purse. As you can see, not the one she wanted, not the best looking coach purse, but there it is in that. Now, just so you know, that was 15 years ago. We have not been back to Chinatown. We have not been back to New York City. We have not been back to the state of New York. We have not been back to the Northeastern United States. Now, friends, the reason I share that story with you is because in, in this journey for us, in this quest to find a, a fake coach purse, the three of us, my brother Elaine and I, we had to make a ton of decisions along the way, and perhaps the most pivotal decision that we made was whether or not we were going to follow this lady that we didn't know down a dark and creepy alleyway. In fact, the, the moment that she made that hard left, we stopped, we paused, and we felt this tension within us. Like, do we go, do we not go on the one hand, we had been looking for a coach purse for probably close to an hour, and we really wanted to get that coach purse for Elaine. But on the other hand, there's just something about this situation that wasn't really sitting right, and we just felt this tension that was making us uncertain as to the decision that we should actually make. You see, friends, one of the realities of the human experience is this. Take a look. That tension gets our attention. Okay, tension gets our attention. In other words, it creates a red flag moment that alerts us that something is not right and that you and I should pay attention to. Okay, think about how this works for a moment. Physiologically, your body creates tension in order to get your attention. For example, if you don't stay hydrated throughout the day, what's going to happen? You're going to get a headache, right? In other words, your body's going to create a tension right here, and the reason it's creating that tension is because it's trying to alert you to pay attention and drink some water. Or have you ever gone a long period of time without eating food? What does your stomach do? It growls, right? It grumbles. In other words, it creates a tension to get your attention so that you eat something. Or friends, what happens to your eyes when you stare at a screen for a long period of time? Right? They, 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 they create a tension. You start to feel this pressure around your eyes saying, stop staring at the screen. It's trying to get your attention. Or friends, how many of you have walked around Walt Disney World for a day? You remember how your feet felt at like four in the afternoon, right? A tension to get your attention. Or how about this? Maybe you've been sitting at a, a meeting before for like two or three hours, and at the two-hour mark, your bladder is full, and so you have this tension that's trying to get your attention, but you don't want to be rude because you don't want to get up in the middle of this person's presentation, so you're kind of shifting in your seat, trying not to think about waterfalls and, and gushing water, all because your bladder is trying to send you a signal that there is a tension that needs to get your attention, that you need to use the restroom. Now, here's the thing about all those examples with your body. Your body is going to continue creating tension until you address the issue. In other words, your body is not going to do what you want it to do until you make a decision that specifically addresses that tension. You see, we are midpoint uh, through this message series that we've been calling Decisions, Decisions. Each week, what we've been doing is taking a look at a different question that we can ask ourselves when we're making decisions that will hopefully help us make 
some better decisions now and in the future. In other words, before we just jump into something, whether it be a, a big decision or a small decision, sometimes it's, it's prudent for us to slow down and ask ourselves some critical questions that will hopefully allow us to make some better decisions. Okay, if you were here with us a couple weeks ago, the first question was we were challenged to look in the mirror and say, am I being honest with myself? Okay, am I being honest with myself? Last week, Pastor Paul talked about how God is with us, and the question is, what story do I want to tell? When I look forward at the different directions and paths in my life, what story do I want to tell? Okay, here's the question that we're going to look at today, which is this. Is there a tension that deserves my attention? Okay, is there a tension that deserves my attention? In other words, when you are in the midst of making a decision, and your brain alerts you that something is not quite right... How do you respond to that situation? Okay, is there a tension that deserves your attention? And if there is, what exactly do you do? How do you respond to that tension? For example, let's say you're walking through Publix or the grocery store and you come across the freezer section and your favorite ice cream is on sale and you reach for it and then all of a sudden you feel this tension. Like on the one hand, you really want this ice cream, but on the other hand, there's something saying, mm, I'm, I'm just not sure if... I should be getting this ice cream right now. And so you find your hand kind of going back and forth, like, should I get it? Should I not get it? What do you decide to do? Okay, how do you deal with that tension? Or how about this one? Maybe you're watching a TV show, and you're really loving it. You're loving the storyline, but then all of a sudden, a scene comes on the screen that's rather sensual. And you feel this tension all of a sudden. What do you do? On the one hand, you're really enjoying this story, but on the other hand, you're not quite sure that you should be watching what's on that screen. How do you deal with that tension? What do you decide to do? Or how about this? It's late at night. You're ready to go to bed. You are zonked. You are tired. And you walk down the hallway, and you pass by your spouse, and you realize that your spouse has been unusually quiet for the past couple hours. And all of a sudden, you feel this tension, like, man, I'm really tired, but at the same time, I'm feeling like my spouse wants me to talk to them. Okay, what do you decide to do? Or maybe you get a job offer, and it's an amazing job offer. It's flexible, great pay, all these things, but there's just, there's something about it. The work environment, something, something that's causing some tension. What do you decide to do? Or friends, maybe you have to make a big decision for your family, or for your business, or for the people you lead and serve, and all the people around you, they're trying to get you to make that decision quickly because they want a resolution, but there's something about making this decision that's causing you some tension. Okay, what do you decide to do? How do you deal with that tension? Okay, that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at how we deal with tension that gets our attention. In other words, when our brain alerts us that something is not quite right, how exactly are you and I, particularly as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to respond? Now, to, to help us answer this question, we're going to take a look at a story from the life of King David. But before he was king, okay, David, he made a whole lot of decisions throughout his life. But there was one in particular that had the potential to completely change the outcome of his life. And it all dealt with how he decided to deal with a tension that got his attention. Now, when David was a teenager, you remember what his occupation was? He was a shepherd, right? He watched after sheep. It was one of the lowliest positions at that time. But you remember one day, this prophet Samuel comes to his house and he says, he anoints him. He says, David, you are going to be the next king of Israel. And the reason was largely the current king, King Saul, he was not doing a very good job as king. And so you, know, you remember what happened next. Of course, he went off and he faced against this, this great giant Goliath, and he slayed him, right? He destroyed him, and overnight, David became a household name. I mean, he became the most popular man in Israel, even more popular than King Saul. Now, you remember, King Saul did not like that somebody was more popular than him, and on top of that, he had heard about the prophecy that this so-called David guy was going to be the next king of Israel, and so you remember what he tried to do? You remember what King Saul tried to do to David? He tried to kill him. In fact, he set out to hunt him down, and David found out about this. He gathered a few of his friends. He ran out into the desert, and he hid. And he hid for quite some time, and every time that King Saul would go out and he would take on other armies, he was constantly looking for David and his friends. Okay, this is where our story is going to pick up today. This is 1 Samuel chapter 24. Take a look. 
It says, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Uh, Now, friends, here is Saul. He's just gotten back from a a situation, and he gets word that David has been spotted in the desert of En Gedi. And so he gathers 3,000 men, probably because he remembers what David did to Goliath, and said, here, let me have some show of force. I'm going to show up with 3,000 men. They go marching through the desert, looking for David, and all of a sudden, King Saul has a tension that gets his attention, right? His bladder is full, and he's got to use the little boy's room. And so he says, hey, guys, if you could just hold on for a second. Uh, There's a cave over here. I'm going to go and relieve myself. And he walks into the cave. Now, watch what happens next. Take a look. It says, David and his men were far back in the cave. Now, friends, how ironic is this? The one cave that you decide to go and use the restroom in is the very same cave that David and his friends are hiding in. I mean, you can imagine how wild this must have been for David and his friends. Like, they're hiding in the back of this cave, and they hear this army. Oh, this has got to be King Saul and his army. And they're marching. You hear them. And then all of a sudden, they stop. And about 30 seconds later, a figure walks into the cave. You see the silhouette. And as this man is walking closer into the cave, you all of a sudden realize this is King Saul himself. You can imagine they were thinking, he's going to kill us. This is it. Our hiding is over with. And then King Saul does something strange. He stops and he turns around and he faces back out towards the entrance of the cave with his back towards David and and the other guys. And he drops his drawers and he relieves himself. Now, friends, think about this for a moment, okay? Don't picture it. Just think about it for a moment. (laughs) King Saul is in a very vulnerable position, yes? I mean, at this point, he is a very easy target, right? You know, here's the thing. Actually, his friends, David's friends, they realize this. They realize that King Saul, they thought he was coming to kill him, and now he's using the restroom, and he's vulnerable and easy to attack? Take a look at what the men said to David. The men said, this is the day that the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Friends, can you imagine the excitement of David's friends when King Saul turns around and squats, right? Can you imagine? They're probably like, David, you remember when you were a teenager and that prophet Samuel came to your house and told you that you would be the next king of Israel? This is your moment. This is your chance. The Lord has delivered your enemy into your hands. All you have to do is creep up behind King Saul and kill him. Now, friends, this moment is very important for you and I to to, to pay attention to because as David is trying to figure out what he's going to do, notice what's happening. He has all these friends that are egging him on, trying to get him to make a decision right away, right now, immediately. You see, when you and I are in the midst of making decisions, sometimes there are external forces around us that are pushing us to make a decision quickly without actually taking the time to actually think it through. For example, when my brother and Elaine and I, when we were standing there, when we saw the woman go down the alleyway and we stopped and we felt that tension, before we could even really think it through, what happened? The lady was like, come this way, come this way, right down, come on, come on, come on, the purses are right down here. You see, when you and I are making decisions, we have to be aware that sometimes we're going to experience external forces that are going to cause us to try and make a decision quickly, when in reality, we should take some time to actually think it through. Because, especially if the tension gets your attention, this can be very dangerous if we don't. In fact, take a look at what happened next. It says, then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now, hold on a second. (laughs) Wasn't David supposed to go and and kill King Saul? I mean, wasn't this his moment to, to, to become the next king of Israel? This doesn't make any sense. Why would he creep up behind King Saul and simply cut off a piece of his robe? Friends, take a look at that verse again. Something happened between the first part of that verse and the second half of that verse. Okay, David crept up behind King Saul, egged on by his friends to kill him, first half of the verse, 
But then he didn't kill him. Second half of the verse. Something happened in that moment. You see, friends, as David was creeping up, he felt a tension that got his attention. Something was not right about the decision that he was about to make. You can almost imagine him having that sword ready to kill King Saul and then sort of lowering it down for a second. You can imagine him thinking like, hold on a second. I need to think this through. Could I kill King Saul right now? <laughs> oh yeah, you betcha. But you know what, there, there, there's something about this situation right now that just doesn't seem right. Yes, I will be the next king of Israel. But you know what, it's not up to me to determine when that's gonna be. In fact, if I kill King Saul, I will be disobeying God. God's the one who anointed him. God's the one who placed him there. And if he's going to take him out, he's going to do it in his own time. But it's not for me to determine when that's going to be. And so you know, I can't do it. In fact, in fact, I won't do it. You see, friends, when David returned to his friends and showed them the piece of King Saul's robe, that was his way of saying he could have killed King Saul, but he didn't. And the reason he didn't was because he felt a tension that got his attention. In fact, take a look at what he said to them here. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Guess what? King Saul remained the king for quite some time afterwards. But you see, David felt that tension. He felt that moment where something wasn't right, and he changed course because he gave himself that moment to pause. You see, David, in a moment where he was easily, could have easily just made that decision, he paused, and he thought about the situation because he experienced a tension that got his attention, and instead of just blowing past the tension or ignoring it altogether, he slowed down, he paused, and he decided that he was gonna live in within that tension until he had clarity as to what decision he needed to make. You see, friends, David's story reminds us that morning that when you and I are making decisions throughout our lives, one of the most powerful tools that we have is simply the ability to pause. That when attention gets your attention, we don't brush by it and we don't ignore it. Instead, we live within that tension until we have peace and clarity as to the decision that we need to make. You know, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus, he was with his disciples in a place called Gethsemane, and at one point, he turned to them, and this is what he said. He said, my soul is, sorrow, is filled with sorrow to the point of death. And friends, Scripture tells us that in that moment, Jesus was troubled. He was filled with sorrow, and the reason he was troubled and filled with sorrow was because he was feeling a, a tension that had gotten his attention. On the one hand, Jesus knew that he had to die. That if you and I were going to be saved from the penalty of our sin, he had to be the one to do it. But on the other hand, his flesh, his flesh did not want to experience death. The pain, the, the agony, it was just too much to bear. And friends, amidst this tension that Jesus was feeling that night, the very night that he was betrayed, you know what he did? He paused, and he knelt down, and he prayed, and he called out to the Father. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Friends, Scripture tells us that as Jesus was praying, the sweat was coming down his face like drops of blood onto the ground. But you see, here's that thing. It was in that moment when he found himself within that moment of tension, that he also had a moment of immense clarity. When he said, Father, not my will, 
but yours be done. You see, friends, because Jesus paused, he was able to deal with the tension that got his attention, and now, with a renewed sense of clarity, just minutes after he did this, he was arrested, and he was beaten, and he was flogged, and the very next day, God's will was done. You see, friends, you and I, we have the honor to be called children of God because we have a Savior who in a moment of tension chose to deal with that tension so that he could save us from the penalty of our sin. And you know what, friends, today, you and I, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, we have the amazing message of opportunity that we have a God that because he paid the penalty of our sin, and because he was victorious over sin, death, and the devil, you and I can be assured today and every single day that God gives us on this earth that nothing, nothing in all creation, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor powers, nor anything, nor depth, nor height, anything in all creation, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Friends, imagine that moment of tension there as he's sitting there and he's not quite sure what to do, but he pauses and he prays and he lifts up to the Father. And because of that decision, you and I today are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You see, friends, when you and I are making decisions throughout our lives and attention gets your attention, here's what I want to encourage you to do this morning. Pause. In other words, if something about that decision is bothering you, let it bother you. In fact, let it bother you until you understand why it bothers you because oftentimes that pause is the difference between a good decision and a not so good decision. For example, when you're at the grocery store and you're, you're reaching to get that ice cream and you feel that tension, pause. Or when you're watching that TV show and all of a sudden that scene comes on that you're not quite sure if you should be looking at and you feel that tension, pause. Or when you walk down the hallway and you can just sense that your spouse is having an issue and you feel that tension, pause. Or when you get that job offer and it's amazing, but there's just something about this job that doesn't seem right, pause. Friends, if you have to make a big decision for your family, or for your business, or for the people you lead and serve, and something is not quite right about that decision, don't rush it. Pause. Or how about this one? If a lady that you've never met before leads you down a dark and creepy alleyway, and you feel that tension, Chris, pause. You see, friends, both David and Jesus remind us this morning that when you and I are making decisions, one of the questions that we can ask is, is there a tension that deserves my attention? And if there is, I want to encourage you this morning, don't blow by it. Don't ignore it. Instead, pause, think, discern, pray, live within that tension until you find clarity as to what decision you need to make. Amen? Amen. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, every day we make so many decisions. Uh, oftentimes there are so many things going on that, that it's very easy for us to make quick decisions, especially if we're feeling pressured by people around us. And yet you remind us that there is great power in the pause. That sometimes when we find ourselves feeling a tension that's getting our attention, we don't have to simply brush right through it and make that decision. We can simply pause, and we can turn to you, and we can pray, and we can seek guidance from those around us and ask questions and think and discern and all these other things so that we have clarity when we actually make that decision later on. Lord, we know that this is not always easy to do, and we ask that your spirit would continue to guide us, to help us make these decisions in our lives. And so we want to lift this up to you today. 
trusting that you hear our prayer, and we pray this by praying the prayer that you taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this is normally the part of the service where we would take up the offering, but as you know, during this season, uh, that's not always the case to do, especially here in worship. But we want to continue to thank you uh, for giving. We have a basket in the back also for those watching online. You can always give at oursaviorfl.org. But as you're making decisions throughout your life, constantly know that there is great power in the pause as both David and Jesus show us this morning. So let's go ahead and stand as we continue our worship together here.